Good evening and welcome to St George's House and the latest in our series of conversations. Uh, I'm delighted that so many of you can be with us tonight and thank you to all of you who have sent in questions in advance for me to put to our guest. In fact, I've had so many questions that I would need three or four hours to put them all to Manette. Um, but that is symptomatic, I think, of the importance of food and farming uh, to the UK. And of course, St George's House has a strain of work, a strand of work around these issues, which has been running now for a number of years. So thank you to all of you. I'll do my best to get through as many questions as possible. Uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege uh, to welcome Minette, Minette Batters to St George's House online. Um, Minette, as many of you will know, is the president of the NFU, the National Farmers Union, often to be heard across the media, whether it's the Today programme, the printed press, or indeed Desert Island Discs back in 2020 during COVID. So Manette, I'm very grateful to you for making the time to be with us uh, this evening. Now, there are many issues we could cover, of course, but I thought I'd, I'd start on a personal note um, because you're not just president of the of, of the NFU but you are indeed a farmer yourself you're a trained chef you've run your own catering business mm -hmm. and I know that your father early on tried to persuade you to do anything except farming but farming called you back the land called you back and I wonder if you might say just a little bit about your path into farming Oh, Gary, well, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a, it's a huge privilege for me to be with you all this evening. Uh, yes, I, it's fair to say I didn't have a sort of traditional route in, and I think almost sort of reverse psychology of if you're told you can't have something or you can't do something, you, you are that much more inquisitive. Um, and so I very much grew up, um, my father... Um, farmed in partnership with my landlords with my mother but he really felt that you know farming was was not not for women and so I was very keen that I pursue uh, another career but I did all our calf rearing uh, before I went to school and I, I did just grow up with a real love of the land I think this is so often the case with farming it's not that you would necessarily want to farm anywhere in the country for me to farm was about farming here it was about farming the land that I knew and loved and I also had a, a massive and have uh, as fair to say a massive affiliation with cows I've got the genetics of, of my cows today go right the way back to cows that my father had and a, a breeding herd is, is sort of very much part of, of the family if you like you know you know their traits uh, those traits are often carried on um, good and bad ones, I might add. Um, so for me, when I started farming in 1998, it, it was the culmination of, of all my dreams coming true, effectively, a, a life's ambition that I didn't think would ever happen. And I certainly never planned to be president of the NFU, guys. So that was that, that in many ways was even more extraordinary. But it's, it's interesting you said there that um, your father had said farming wasn't for women. Do you think that has changed are there more women in farming now? Is there is there a shift in that direction? Oh, a massive shift. And it's slightly bizarre, really, because women always have been involved in farming. I mean, you know, most farms are, are family run businesses. Um, and I certainly know and see all the time that the women in the business are playing a, a massively important role and juggling multiple balls usually. So so there's nothing new for women to be involved in farming. But what I do think is changing is when I go to the agricultural colleges, the universities, there are far more women um, coming into the industry. I mean, most of them, it's 50-50. And in fact, in some cases, you're seeing more women than men. And certainly that is the case with, with vets. You know, they are certainly seeing now more women coming forward. So I, th I think that's brilliant. And at the end of the day, we, we want a balance. You know, we, we want a, a good balance of people and a good balance of people who want to come forward and represent. It, it did take 100, over 100 years to get a woman in the NFU. And I hope there'll be many more uh, soon after me. And, and, and as the first woman president of the NFU, 
in what is a traditionally male environment. How have you found that? Have you had to adapt your leadership style? It's it's funny. I remember when I came in, um, everybody said oh, it'll be so much more difficult being a woman. You will find it more difficult. And now what I get said to me is, well, of course, it's so much easier being a woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I I don't really know. I mean, I I don't think I've had to adapt. I'm I'm very with young people, with our members, you know, I, I represent an extremely broad church. So I, I try and, you know, be, I, I guess I get asked to a lot of, of all female events and there's been some brilliant women in ag uh, events, but I, I try and be broader because I, that is my role um, is, is to represent everyone. And I, I think, um, you know, I have to be careful on that, but I also feel I have a duty to empower young people in general um, to, you know, to have a say, I guess, you know, this is what I feel is so important about the NFU, you know, we're, we're representing 47,000 farming and growing businesses, so we're represented by farmers, we're an organisation um, that's led by farmers, that's owned by farmers, but we're backed by technical expertise within our staff, so we cover all aspects, you know, literally from legal to regulation to environmental to the commodities, every single bit of policy is covered off. And I think that makes us quite unique, actually, to be farmer led, but backed by the technical expertise on every level. And I just wanted to stick for a moment with that uh, generational thing, because one of the things we have found in the consultations here at St. George's House is the business of the transition from generation to generation. So do you feel that young people are coming into farming or those who were born into farming families are staying with it or are they leaving? What, what, what do you think about that? I think it's, it's actually changing a, a lot right now. Um, there's no doubt it is very, very difficult um, to a certain extent always has been to come into the industry. You know, we've, we've got a lot less county farms than we used to have which were often a very good stepping stone we've got less of them um we've got agricultural holding tenancies that are pretty much you know coming to an end so to make your way if you don't have access to land ownership is ever more difficult and of course you know funding when we were in europe there were funding pots that very much helped new entrants come in I think we are going into a whole new era of food production um, here in the UK. So I don't think that that is any easier and probably more difficult. But I do think that the jobs are sort of opening up, really. And I think we will see enormous change in the next 10 years on the journey to net zero carbon neutral food production, the role of not only producing food, but producing fibres for sustainable living and, and green fuel. And I don't think that actually, you know, having access to land will be the priority that it has been. Um, I can see, you know, a far more sort of added value, the way we can sell online now, we can access consumers anywhere in the world. I, I think it's changing fast. And I, I really hope that opens it up to a much wider audience. Yeah, and there is, there is, of course, the question also of diversification. And we think of farming as a very traditional industry, but you, you yourself host weddings, etc. cetera. Um, has the, the farming community in general embraced diversification or is that a bit of a battle still? I think diversification has been an incredibly important part of a lot of businesses. But that said, it is not for everyone. Um, my business has been very diversified throughout. Um, my background has been very diversified, but a lot of people are not in the right location. And perhaps, you know, their skill set is is absolutely with farming. You know, we run a wedding venue here. You know, it can be very late nights. It can be different types of, of stresses which don't suit everyone. Um, and of course, course planning, um, connectivity are all big issues for diversification. And some parts of the country, you know, are, are just not suited to it. So it's why we always make such, and people will be hearing us more and more and more talking about, you know, farmers' first duty is producing food. 
And that's what I'm always really keen to make sure is that actually the policy environment is about food production and the environment, you know, having that symbiotic relationship, not one or the other. And then, yeah, I think the future going forwards will be more diversification. Maybe, you know, I'm talking to my children about their careers, you know, having a, another job as well alongside. Um, we're going to have to manage our risk much better than we have done in the past. That's for certain. Yeah. And just thinking about that primary function of putting food on the table, um, I think when through COVID, quite rightly, the NHS were the kind of the heroes and heroines of the day. But actually, it was the farmers who got the food to the uh, to the tables. And I, I wondered what you felt the impact of COVID was on the farming sector. Well, Look, I couldn't agree with you more on the NHS. I mean, I think it was, you know, for those of us that that know people in the medical profession, for those of us that that experienced it, my daughter was actually in hospital when we were in lockdown. It was just it, quite incredible um, and indeed still is. And farmers were the key workers. And I think um, I think people probably did start to think actually food doesn't just happen it isn't just magic out of nowhere because I think all of us found times when we couldn't buy what we wanted to buy I can remember you know, really struggling to buy bread flour for instance there were times when milk supplies went a bit short um, everybody bizarrely experienced shortages of blue rolls which I've always been told since there never was a shortage but when you have a population this size and when there are shortages, which many people will be experiencing now with salads, it, it's amazing how the tendency is then to, to buy an extra one uh, so that you don't run short. And so it's very, very fragile, effectively, food distribution in this country. And we know with our conversations with retailers, it was quite bizarre, really, to start off with. We'd all been used to going out, having our, our cappuccinos and, and everything else. And then suddenly we were locked down. and we couldn't have a cappuccino. We were having a Nescafe with a splash of milk. So for dairy, those that were supplying Costa Coffee and others, that market just crashed completely overnight. We started eating a lot of mints. We weren't eating any steaks. And the chillers filled up and up and up with prime cuts and steaks. And the price plummeted. And we worked with retailers and we got promotions going. And and it was amazing, actually, how people started living at home, how they did out of home. So lamb sales rose, you know, and people really did embrace cooking from scratch and cooking at home. And, and I hope we don't lose that mm -hmm. because I think it gave us closer connections with our food that was incredibly valuable for us. Yeah. And, and just one of the things about COVID that we hear a lot across the country is the impact it had on people's mental health. Uh, and I just wondered if that was uh, a, an issue in your sector as well. I'm sure it was, but how how difficult was that for the farming sector? Well, I think there were two two parts to that, uh, Gary, in some ways, because I was the footpath that runs right through my farm. Uh, it was like a motorway. I mean, it it we had pe people constantly on it because, of course, you could only go out for one walk a day and people needed to get out. And the great thing about that, and I had loads of conversations with different people, and I always remember talking to one woman who said, I would just have gone completely mad if I hadn't been able to come out and walk through your farm. She said it is just literally getting out, seeing the animals, being in a green space. She said it really has sort of, you know, helped me get through this. And, and a lot of people felt like that. And then for farming, I think in some ways, we were the lucky ones because we could carry on doing exactly what we were always doing. You know, farming didn't stop at all. And in many ways, you know, people, when they were um, spring drilling, they were in their cabs, you know, they were fully isolating. And so I, I think farmers on the back of it actually felt, you know, gosh, we were lucky compared to a lot of other people. And everybody was saying that the footpaths were so busy. But that aside, you know, I think farming is incredibly isolated. Um, mental health is is a massive issue. I think right now with so much change going on, people lack of certainty is really, I think, fueling concern. And so mental health is something that worries me enormously with with farmers because they're very isolated. 
they can't on the whole take a day off sick if you're lambing if you're carving you have just got to keep going 24 7 until it's done and and that's that's challenging and what are the support mechanisms like in that situation oh it's interesting isn't it because um we've obviously been very involved with our sort of opposite numbers in ukraine the ukrainian agrarian forum and I know a lot of farmers that I represent have been very keen to give money directly to them. And they don't have any farming charities like we have. So we have amazing farming charities like RABI, the Addington Fund, FCN that does brilliant work. And so, you know, if, if you wanted to give money and, and we just had our conference and we raised nearly 15,000 for FCN, you've got places where you can you can send money to. In Ukraine, there was the DEC um, humanitarian aid fund, and, and that was it. There are no farming charities. So I think we're we're lucky, actually. So often you take these things for granted and you presume that everybody has them. Um, and certainly it's been a real eye opener in Ukraine, where of course they desperately need help, whereby we can't get aid actually specifically to farming families. Yeah, and just interestingly there, you mentioned the recent conference where um, a certain Secretary of State behaved interestingly, maybe is the, the polite way to put it. I mean, how do you find dealing with government as you've done as president of the NFU? Is it tricky to make headway? Oh gosh, um, it, it's like life really. It's, it's all about relationships and you never really achieve a positive on the back of a negative. But that said, you know, we are there to hold power to account. And so I have found it a bit of a tightrope of making sure that politicians, uh, our political leaders are challenged. And I've tried very hard with the organization and leading it, wherever there is a problem that we work up a policy solution. We don't just complain about it. We say, well, actually, this is what it could look like. Um, but Politicians, like all of us, are very, very different. So I, I work with um, Michael Gove uh, in the first place. Um, then it was George Eustace, a uh, brief stint of, of Theresa Villiers. Um, and now, of course, uh, Therese Coffey. And um, she, I have to say, is, is different again to all of the rest of them. Um, and I, I, th I think it's been unfortunate the last, the last week. Um, and primarily down actually to questions in, in Parliament. Um, I, I'm sure she regrets talking about turnips. Um, <laughs> with, the, with the salad shortages we faced, I've certainly know more about turnips now uh, than I ever did. And, and actually this time of year is not the best time of year. And I remember uh, actually we used to grow roots and of course the best time of year really is late summer, um, early autumn when the roots are young. Now, you know, they're, they're not good, but yeah, it's work in progress. Um, I'm continually investing in that relationship. But we have the farming minister, Mark Spencer, who's, who's doing a good job. But the stakes feel high, Gary, right now. And so it, it, it's really important that we get this right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose one of the things, and, and I have to use the word, the Brexit word, um, the common agricultural policy uh, has been replaced by the EMs. Now, the common agricultural policy I can remember was complained about, criticised press, public ministers, everybody. But with Brexit, supposedly has come an opportunity to, to show that the UK can do better, make a farming policy fit for Britain. But it seems to be taking a long time. How, how do you feel we're doing? Mm. You're right. The CAP was, was criticised a lot. Um, in some cases, unfairly so. I mean, you know, when you think why Europe came together, um, it was very much on the back of a starving Europe. You know, food security really mattered and the decision was taken that actually, you know, coming together, the creation of the common market when we joined in 73. Um, and it, there were peaks and troughs, I guess. You know, we went into overproduction, heavily subsidised, um, which caused a, a lot of problems globally. But where we ended up in the end, it was far more of a social policy, really. The direct payment, the land-based payment was very much about keeping farmers on the land in, in very isolated areas in many ways. 
and we've we're losing that in England you know it is it is changing and I guess you know what what worries me most is we are going into a very different trading relationship um you know we've had these trade deals now concluded with Australia and New Zealand those two countries are the the most um competitive agricultural traders in the world they are fully liberalized because they're very scaled uh and you know they've got a very small population so we've fully liberalized on those trade deals and you know australia has access to massive feedlot systems in a way that we will never have here um we have an incomparable farming system um they've actually been carved out of um you know australia's work on on climate change so they are allowed to operate freely and independently we are facing huge levels of, of legislation and regulation change that will actually put us above the eu level so the elm scheme fundamentally must be focused on both it must be focused on food production and environmental delivery I would like to see far more scientific rigor in the approach at the moment. Um, we've got some great um, uh, research and, and development institutions. You know, Rothamsted has done a huge amount on soils. We've got NIAB. Um, we've got the Wakehurst project. I would like to see far more scientific rigor in, in what's uh, uh, on the table at the moment. And that isn't there. And I also think we mustn't forget the social aspect of all of this. You know, public monies for public goods is about farmers doing a, a lot more to get paid for what they have done. So it's not about a level of profitability, which, of course, there was in the land based payment. There was a level of farm profitability, which helped, you know, when you had a drought like you did last summer, you know, the government decided to pay half of that early to help with forage costs. And that has been a cushion that has definitely helped. Now, when you say goodbye to all of that and you open your doors to the rest of the world to trade with, I worry about how we will cope with the volatility. I worry about the social aspect of keeping farmers on the land because that underpins schools, tourism, allied trade. You know, you take agriculture out and, and your rural economy would look very, very different. So there are it's taken time, too much time, and there is a lot more to be done before it is really fit for post-Brexit Britain. Yeah. And I mean, I know that one of the, the, your concerns is food security uh, and indeed the standards uh, which are now seem to be shifting and possibly shifting. And, uh, you know, the pressure to farm for the good of the environment and rewilding will eat up land needed for food production. Uh, so how do we how do we square that? I, I'm not sure how that can be squared. Mm. Well, we have ever greater requirements out of our land use. Um, you know, there are big um, uh, legislation uh, challenges. You know, the government has set environmental targets that are legislated to achieve on clean air, clean water. We have targets on on trees. Uh, we have targets on nature. So we have ever greater requirements out of our land. And we shouldn't forget in all of that, of course, you know, solar farms, because, you know, the ability to have more renewable energy here. But there's trade offs, you know, and, and if you went too much down any of those roads and you compromised your food production, you know, I think that would be to the detriment. So you've got to try and, and do all of it and do all of it better. And that really means that in you know the policy landscape, whether that is local authorities, whether that is Westminster, of course we're devolved, so Scotland and Wales will have their own frameworks. We've got to be able to set out a framework that is about food production as well as energy and nature. Um, and that can be done, it really can be done, but there's a danger now with these legislated targets, solar, index link locked in for 25 to 30 years very very interesting for a lot of landowners that are looking at it now thinking how do I shore up my risk and there's a danger that food production just becomes the poor relation in all of those which is why we are saying to the government you know we want the prime minister to do what he said in August set a self-sufficiency target in broad terms we've been about 60 percent self-sufficient and introduce a statutory reporting on it so that 
we would know if our cell sufficiency is slipping or not. And as an example, you know, egg production in 2022 was down nearly a billion eggs from 2019. Now, if you were reviewing this annually, you would be saying, well, actually, we've been self-sufficient in eggs. We do not want to be slipping. What can be done to give our, our poultry uh, egg producers the confidence to, you know, invest in in their flock in their laying flocks and, and make sure that you know we are upping production in that area so i think it's really important we take domestic food production seriously and you know one final thing playing out now everybody will be you know not able to buy the salad that they would have been able to buy we should have avoided this we've been saying for a long time we we face food supply issues if we don't take domestic food production seriously. We've got a lot of glass houses that are mothballed at the moment yeah. that should be brimming with produce. And I hope, I hope this is a wake up call. Yeah, but do, do we, Minette, do we need to have everything available all the time, all year round? Or do we just need to think a little more carefully about that? I think, um, seasonality is is something that has been forgotten and it's a great shame because actually if you follow the seasons i mean my background was as a chef and i actually loved following the seasons because you know to me there is nothing better than a than british asparagus or a british strawberry you can get them all year round but honestly if if you have british when it's in season um, it's com a completely different experience. Mm. Um, so I think seasonality matters. I think that's why I've always been passionate about food and farming in schools, in our education system, learning how to cook and valuing food. We waste billions of pounds worth of food because we don't value it. We're eating far too much processed food. So a healthy, balanced diet, cooking from scratch, recognizing seasonality, um, but there's a danger that we're really producing so much less of what we're good at. I mean, field vegetables, you know, leeks, carrots, cauliflower, purple sprouting, brilliant, iconic British vegetables, parsnips. And we're producing a lot less of them. So we've got to incentivize. That's because the cost of production has gone up so high, 50 percent higher than it was in 2019. And those farmers and growers aren't getting any different return from the market to what they were getting in 2019. So if your costs have gone up 50%, it's no surprise that you're not going to be able to keep producing at the same volume. And that's why I'm continually saying, you know, we've got to give these farmers and growers the confidence to make these big investments. And, you know, that means action from government and retailers. Yeah. And you, you mentioned there briefly uh, education. And I know you've been behind a number of campaigns, not least with Jamie Oliver on the whole business of eating well in schools and learning about food. Is Do you think that is having a lasting impact? Oh, it's something that I'm really, really passionate about, because I think, you know, if we, if we don't learn uh, about about food when we're at school, you know, A, we'll, we'll never truly value it. I, I, for me, learning to cook is, is one of the most important skills that you will ever learn. And, and it's a huge pleasure. I mean, I still, I'm not cooking, obviously, professionally anymore, but I absolutely love cooking. And, um, you know, you, you are what you eat. So I, I think it's incredibly important. But with the NFU, what we've been really focusing on is linking agriculture to STEM learning. And I've seen with my own eyes, you know, how children, you know, many of us learn through a vocational lens much better than we do sort of via a desktop exercise effectively. And there's nothing like agriculture for making that link and particularly the journey to net zero. These kids that we've worked with have been so inspiring with the things that they have been developing and the teachers saying, Agriculture is a really, really good fit for, you know, these kids understanding STEM and it being part of it. So I hope and I'd like to think that that might happen one day. Good. And, and one of the things that uh, the house here has been interested in is the whole business of livestock transition. And young people, of course, are very adamant and strong willed and strong voiced about eating less meat. Um, and I just wonder what the impact of that will be 
on, on the livestock farming in this country. What, what's your sense of that from the NFU? So it's fair to say nothing annoys my members more um, than Veganuary, effectively. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because that actually, you know, is, is not getting the support that it used to. When we speak to the retailers, they say, actually, people are transitioning far more to a flexitarian diet which means that they might have a, a meat-free day. Uh, for me, the big issue is highly, highly processed foods. Um, actually, we, we demonize eating meat, but the demonization should be around highly processed foods um, that we know are doing, that are doing damage, that you know, contain a, a, a lot of salt and a lot of sugar in some cases, and getting people back to a healthy, balanced diet. And, you know, the eat well plate, which has been the guidance for a long time now, you know, is very much meat and dairy being part of that healthy, balanced diet. But I think there's another point here and that, you know, many parts of the world are suffering from ever greater challenges of water security. And here in the UK, where we have, you know, a temperate climate, we grow grass. I have visited many countries in Europe, actually, whereby livestock is never outside livestock is inside and whatever grass there is whatever forage there is is cut and taken to the livestock now we absolutely should be producing high quality sustainable red meat and dairy here because we have the grass and the grazing capability to to do that and what we're not consuming here we should be exporting to other parts of the world who don't have the luxury of the climate that we have but in order to get to net zero, you know, that is about farming smarter and that is about better health status, better genetics, probiotics, the science and the innovation, decreasing the food production footprint. But, you know, my answer fundamentally on, on um, plant based and meat based is you can have unsustainable plant and you can have unsustainable meat and, and both are damaging to our planet. So we want sustainable livestock and we want sustainable plant-based. And that has to be the focus. Okay. And I wanted to ask you also about uh, technology, new technology. And, uh, you know, we constantly hear about labor shortages in farming. We have people there to pick the fruit to do, et cetera, et cetera. Technology is really advancing at quite a pace. And I wonder how, the farming sector is embracing that and if that is going to be central to it over the next years and decades um without doubt without doubt it is i mean i've watched robots picking um you know we've got the capability now a robot can pick a strawberry but it's interesting the ai technology is having to come from the human into the robot to build its capability so it still can't pick uh, and put that strawberry in the box at the same rate as, as our hands can pick. So the dexterity of the human hand is absolutely essential. But the time will come when these robots will be able to pick as fast as the human hand. Um, I think we're a little way off, but we're probably only four or five years off, um, depending on how much investment there is, because hugely, hugely expensive. Um, so I think the technology on robotics will come. You talk about precision farming. I mean, you know, people tend to think that fertilizers, pesticides, you know, that too much can be used. These are extremely expensive products. And I mean, we saw the price of nitrogen fertilizer rise, you know, triple digits. Um, unbelievable um, how that um, cost inflation took off. And the same with chemicals as well. So it's in everybody's interest to use as little as possible and as sparingly as possible. So precision agriculture and, um, you know, mapping so that you are knowing exactly where you've got to be treating a field is, is really good for everybody. More importantly, it's good for our planet too. So those technologies are game changing and I think improving all the time as well. Yeah, but when you mentioned there the four, it'll take four to five years at best. As it, so how do we bridge that gap? You know, what happens over that four or five years, which in the lifetime of a farm is quite substantial? Yeah. Well, that is why we've made such a strong case for the seasonal workers scheme. 
um, the seasonal worker scheme this year as a 45,000 with the option of another 10,000 if it's needed. That's enormously appreciated. Um, it's been challenging, I think, you know, in leaving Europe, it was ending free movement. And so now the Home Office has set up this globalised um, scheme. It means that we know exactly who is coming here. We know how long they're here for and we know when they go away again. And while they're here, obviously, this is a highly regulated industry. Um, in fact, the wage rate for last year was set above our national living wage. It was set at 1010. So, you know, it's 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 well paid. It's not this sort of cheap labor that many people talk about. And it's really essential that we do encourage people who want to come here, but that we also try and empower people who are here, students and others, to get back to that type of work. It's difficult because counties like Herefordshire, of course, you've got very low levels of unemployment and you've got a requirement for two and a half thousand seasonal workers. Um, but I, I think we can build what I would call a bridge to the world of automation, but we should be under no illusions about the huge cost of automation. And, you know, there is questions to be asked about who is going to pay for that, because the consumer won't want to pay more for what they buy. And can the business with all of these other costs, can they afford to invest? So that's. That's a big challenge. That's going to be tricky. And the freedom of movement, of course, was a result of Brexit. And it is a perception, and I say only a perception, I have no idea if it's true or not, that the farming community really voted mainly to leave. That might be right, it might not. But it put the NFU in a very tricky situation. Mm -hmm. Do we stay? Do we go? That was a very delicate dance. And how, how did you handle that? So it was uh, incredibly difficult. We're, of course, completely democratic. Um, you know, we are we are farmer led, we are farmer owned. And so it was really important to bring our, our membership with us. So we were never going to campaign, um, but we did take a public position, which our council, our sovereign body uh, came to the decision that on the knowledge that we had, uh, the interests of British agriculture would be best served by remaining in the EU. Um, that was it, really. We, we never campaigned. We just wanted to inform uh, our members of that. But I, I think the challenge was, you know, there was uh, effectively three slogans. You know, you're going to get a lot more money, as will the NHS, as will everyone else, because we won't be investing it in the EU. Well, that has not transpired because the CAP was a multi-annual budget that actually sat outside of parliamentary cycles. The second one was, um, it's going to be the easiest trade deal in history, the trade deal with the EU. Well, we all know how long it has taken and, and Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister looks like he might, with the Windsor framework, uh, very, <laughs> very timely to be having this discussion, with the Windsor framework, it, it looks like he might have um, the final chapter in Brexit to be closed. But look how long that has taken. So yeah. it was not an easy thing to conclude. And then finally, you know, we were going to have a bonfire of regulation. You know, that was the line. Well, we'll get rid of all this regulation and you will just be able to get on and farm. Well, look at what we have. You know, yeah. we have legislation that is now sitting above the EU. Um, we want to have higher standards of animal welfare, higher standards of environmental protection. Um, species reintroductions, uh, all of which, yes, fine, but it is not what was promised when we left. So I don't think really farmers were any different to anyone else. The 52, 48, uh, many people were very divided yeah. as to which way to vote. But those were the three things on offer. None of them happened. But here we are now, and amongst your membership, do you get any sense of regret that it went the way it went? I think most people, including myself, are pragmatic. I think, you know, um, we are lucky enough to live in a democracy when we look at, at how Putin is behaving and, and Russia, it makes you realise how lucky you are to live uh, in a, a democracy. And, and that vote happened and we have left and we have to now channel a, a new path. 
And it's perfectly doable. I mean, I will always remain extremely angry about the trade deals and how much they gave away to Australia and New Zealand. But we probably, with our standards campaign, referenced Jamie Oliver, we had a million people supporting that. One thing I think we most definitely did do was make sure that we are never importing hormone-treated beef, um, pig meat that has been uh, treated with ractor bromine. So, you know, I, that won't happen. I am very confident to say that that will never happen. But I do think they gave away far too much for far too little. We could do a trade deal with Australia. That was always going to be done. But we should have retained our sensitive sectors so that if there was a problem and there is a problem going forwards, we can do something about it. We gave away that right. And why, when we were taking back control, why would we hand away all our powers and have no say in being able to deal with the problem if there was one? So I personally won't forgive them for that. I'm going to bring it back a bit more locally now, just with a question about um, the power of the supermarkets. Uh, you know, I'm constantly hearing, particularly with dairy farming, you know, the price of milk, the quotas, et cetera. It is such a difficult business to get any margin of profit in. And do you think is that reversible? Is that manageable? Or is that just the way it is in, in a capitalist society that the market dictates? So that has been the line for, for a long time. Successive governments, cheap food has been the aim. And we've we've sort of allowed, and, and really there are no winners in this world, we've allowed a, a very, very powerful retailer monopoly uh, to be established that actually doesn't really help uh, anybody in that supply chain. It's very cutthroat. We live with a retail price war now all the time. And that's primarily due to the rise of the discounters. So Aldi increasing their market share all the time. They are the discounters. They discount on price. That's what they do. Tesco's, of course, is always trying to keep pace with the discounters because it doesn't want to lose market share to them. And everybody else has to follow Tesco's. So we live in this very, very challenging environment. And I, I really believe it has to change. And I think what we are living through at the moment is, is a sign of what has happened. You know, we are effectively the market of last resort. Because, I mean, as an example, you know, if you want to buy a pepper at the moment, you, you can actually buy a pack of three peppers for what one pepper would cost you in the Netherlands. So some countries have just passed these costs on to their consumer. Some have become very well hedged and it's business as usual. We understandably are not passing these costs on to the consumer because we want food to stay as affordable as possible. But we're also not helping in that, you know, primary production is not part of the energy intensive scheme, the ETII scheme of governments. Um, we're not hedged. So you've got the primary producer, whether it's poultry, meat, eggs, horticulture, pigs, you know, you've got those producers taking all of that risk and all of that cost. And what are you going to see? Well, you're going to see less being produced. That's what's happening. So I think the world of retail, we need to rethink what it looks like because it's nobody intended it to look like this. And I'm not sure that there are any winners in it either. Uh, that, that sounds like a, a topic for a George's House consultation. Um, um, Minette, do you think, almost lastly, is, is farming, is it an industry or a vocation? Yeah. Oh, that's a very, very good question. It's, it's both, I think. It, it has to be a way of life uh, as well as an industry because it has such extraordinary challenges that are thrown at you. You know, if you, if you have an office that is outside, you know, with ever more extreme weather events, you are going to have some years whereby it is just really tough and you don't make any money and potentially you lose a lot of money. And so I genuinely believe it is one industry where, where you have to love it in order to do it. Um, there are many jobs out there that are nine to five and you go in and you do the job and you earn the money. And it doesn't really matter whether you love the job or not, because you've got an income, you know exactly what you're going to get every week. Farming isn't like that. You know, farming, you never you never really know what is going to happen next. 
so if you're going to do it you have to you have to love it and the challenges that it throws at you um and that probably sounds quite weird to a lot of people doing other things because you think well why why would you but you know i i think the highs for me are far greater than the lows you know we're coming into our lambing calving season i yeah. i still nothing gives me a greater buzz than seeing a calf or a lamb being born seeing new life come into the world it feels an enormous privilege to be farming and and that's a unique experience and and do you think your twins might follow you into farming that's interesting, isn't it? Because they they actually do think my work life balance is not very good, and I think young <laughs> young people are far more into work life balance than I ever was. I've just sort of been into work, uh, and the role of the NFU it means that I am incredibly busy because you know I am running a business, I am mother to twins, albeit eighteen year old ones now, um, and you know the the role is enormous and the pressure is enormous but it's an it's it's a great privilege to do it and it's a once in a lifetime you know I'll have done a decade effectively leading the NFU and I'll always be enormously grateful for that opportunity but my children I think they are thinking we'll get out and we'll do something else uh and I've said to them I will keep the business going I will build the business in 10 years time if you're not coming back you need to let me know but I'm I'm keen, Gary, if I'm honest, I'm keen for them to get out and, mm. and see other businesses, see other industries, because I think that's needed now. You know, you, you need to get out and really inform, you know, a, a forensic opinion of, of how you would take the farm forwards. Good, good. Well, you said it's been a privilege to be president of the NFU. It's been a privilege for us uh, to hear uh, your conversation tonight and if if, uh, if you can just promise me one thing please please put a stop to the revival of the turnip <laughs> above <laughs> above all else but wow. Manette, thank you so much for making the time um it really has been an honor to talk to you and i know our audience will have had a great deal a great deal from this oh well, gary just to say enormous thanks to you and and the team for having me on and enormous thanks to everybody for listening it's been wonderful thank you okay. And so just let me finish by thanking our audience for, for joining us uh, this Thursday evening. And I look forward to future conversations. But for now, thank you to Manette. Thank you to all of you. Keep well. And from St. George's House, good night. <laughs>